Glory to God. Glory to thee, O God. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boats, and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please don't leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is a holy scripture. Praise to thee, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. My grandfather, Grandpa Bowman, we called him, was a wonderful man to us grandkids. Uh, since there was only three of us grandkids, he didn't have to spread himself very thin to, uh, to kind of dote on us all. Statistically, he was known for working at the local refinery. He was married to my grandmother for over 60 years and had two children, my mom and my uncle Kenny. But personally, he was known for four things. He was a deacon at his church. He had three huge gardens that he was responsible for, one at his place, one at our place, and one at his mother's. Was secretary at his local lodge, and he loved to fish. When are you going to take me fishing? He would ask with a twinkle in his eye. You knew that he was really the one taking you, so it seemed sort of a grown-up thing as a kid for him to ask you, when are you going to take me fishing? It was almost like I was the one responsible for it. But that was his hook. It was his phrase that captured my attention and captures others' attention. You know what a hook is, a verbal hook? It's that phrase that uh, gets your attention. A sales pitch or a commercial, they use them often. You, you see them. But even in music, uh, that's that repeated part of a song or a piece of music that's particularly pleasing, that's easy to remember. It could be the chorus. It could be a, a background hook. It could be a hook from another song that somehow they sampled into their work. A really good hook would reel you in, get you committed. And my grandfather's hook was, when are you going to take me fishing? Now, later in life, his uh, dementia was getting the best of him. And it was one of the few things that he could remember to say to people, to just about anybody, really, and it would work, even if he couldn't remember much more about that person. He would meet somebody new at the church, and he would say, when are you going to take me fishing? He would run on somebody that he should know to remember their name, but he couldn't remember the name. He'd still say, hey, when are you going to take me fishing? To little kids, to adults, to family members, or community members, or even a stranger. Everyone was greeted with, hey, when are you going to take me fishing? And it worked too. In this small rural Oklahoma town, pretty much everybody knew where there was a good fishing hole. Most of them had been fishing at least once in their lives. They know where to go. Now, we had two stock ponds in our, on our property. So, it really wasn't specially, we weren't really going anywhere. Usually, he was coming to us. He would holler and say, when are you going to take me fishing? We'd all get ready and go outside and, uh, you know, put on our play clothes or whatever and go outside and, and go fishing. It's just a lazy afternoon thing that we did. But I was a hyper kid back then. 
Uh, you probably would have diagnosed me today with some disorder or, or pumping me full of pills just to keep me calm and concentrating. But all I needed at that time, at least, was Grandpa's patience, a couple of medium-sized ponds full of mud, some rocks to try to skip, a few frogs and turtles, and a, maybe even some snakes here and there, and lots of fish to catch my attention. Now, as a child in church, when we heard this Bible story that we just read, I wonder what it would be like having Jesus use my grandfather's verbal hook. When are you going to take me fishing? If he had really said that to the disciples. If he had asked the disciples to follow him, would Jesus have really gotten the same response? When are you going to take me fishing? Now, other than catching a 10-pound bass, and, and one, time, uh, I, I, one time I remember a snake in mid-process mid of swallowing one of our fish on a stringer, one of my most memorable highlights of my fishing times was when my sister was about kindergarten age. Now, some of y'all met my sister, so uh, you might remember to tease her later about this, but she was learning to cast her own line. And one of our closest neighbors uh, was Slim Adams and his family uh, lived about a half a mile away from us. And one of his uh, grandsons, Chris Adams, uh, was old enough to ride his bike and come join us. And he'd bring his own fishing pole sometimes and come join us. Now, us guys, we weren't really paying much attention. My grandfather had kind of gotten a little bit busy with whatever he was doing. So my sister being new, she was still trying to practice casting her line. And she failed to estimate how far back her swing was. And as she went back, she took a hook right into Chris Adams' lip. And he let out a whelp. <laughs> Screamed. Bloody murder. I mean, I mean this, she said it because she's hooking it in and setting it. It was awful. But a little peroxide and a call to his mother to verify that he had had his Texas vaccination. Or te tetanus, not Texas. Well, I, from Oklahoma, you have to be te vaccinated from Texas. <laughs> oh, my heavens. My Oklahoma friend, yeah, you have to be Texas vaccinated. He had his tetanus. All was pretty much good. But the inside joke was now on my sister. <laughs> It wasn't that she had just set this deep hook into Chris's lip. We always said that she had caught a man. <laughs> now this was funny on many levels to me as a kid. Because she was still in that boys are icky stage and she didn't really want to have anything to do with boys. And here it was, she certainly didn't want to have caught a man. And we kept saying it, you caught a man. And she probably didn't need her two older brothers to find anything else to continue to tease her about because we were pretty good about pestering her. But the best part of it gave me this mental picture of witnessing Jesus calling people to be fishers of men when Jesus asked people to follow him and that he would make them fishers of humanity I had this comical picture in my mouth, in my mind, of my sister catching Chris with this painful hook in his mouth. Now, American Christians, we really, uh, and especially me as a child, we picture fishing, casting a line with maybe a rod and a reel. Now, there are some specialized versions of that and, and, and fly fishing and things like that, but it was a nice picture for a children's moment, if you will. I probably was kind of benefiting from that, at least in my mindset of fishing enough and, and hearing the Bible story enough that I thought of fishing with a reel. And it also fed into sort of this personal evangelism, if you will, the model that I was taught about. And since so I knew full well that casting a line from one rod meant catching only one fish at a time or maybe two based on how many maybe hooks you had on there. It would have been a little bit more accurate narratively to gesture throwing, though, in the Bible story, actually throwing a dragnet. But we didn't really do that back in Oklahoma. But this was more accurate what was happening with the fishermen. They were throwing out a net to brag in. And it just might have been more uh, um, accurate if you imagine evangelism as more than, a, more than just an individual thing. It's more of a movement. It's a group phenomenon. It's everybody coming into the goodness of God. It's calling all people around you to participate in the reign of God that is at hand rather than some personal approach or one person trying to get one other person. 
We also have to look at this Bible story in a communal, geological, and personal understanding to sort of get our theological point across here. Now, communally, this was a fishing community. The majority of their day was fishing. That was their lives. It all revolved around fishing. Now, you might think of the television show like The Deadliest Catch or, or some other uh, fishing sports show that really ends up being more of an infomercial telling what the latest gadget or latest boat you need to buy. But anyway, you kind of got that idea that this is the way they made their living. <coughs> Their livelihood, their whole world, their whole community depended on good fishing. The weather, the environmental issues, they could either be beneficial or problematic. Getting good trade for your fish was important. See, this wasn't some casual, restful fishing out on the banks of some pond in Oklahoma. Now, geographically, we know that people who live on the prairies, we realize that they think different than city folks, or different than mountain folks, or those who live by the sea. You see, places matter too. Of course, it might be a little hard to get a little handle on this. We may have a hard time describing such things, but we really know certainly that there are understandings about being from one certain country or another, a certain areas, even if my country is different than your country, if we're both in the plain areas, then maybe we'd have the same understanding of things. And rightly or wrongly, we, we point to areas on the map and we make descriptive comments about them. One, may, one place may be more urban, another more redneck. One region... Maybe a little more très chic, and another one somewhat backwards. One place may be considered conservative, another be considered ultra-liberal. In more recent times, we hear often in the news about the red state America, or blue America, the liberal coast, or the conservative south. You see, places matter. So it's important when we look at the Bible stories to understand that the places matter as well. The idea that Jesus and where Jesus was from and where Jesus was going and where he found these people. You know, when we think of the Bible and the Bible times, we all consider it just kind of lumping in one understanding of it's the Holy Lands. And you hear people maybe have gone to travel to Jerusalem or anything like that and they've gone to the Holy Lands. But in our limited understanding, it's, we just get it that that's where Jesus walked. And that's what made it holy. And we kind of say that just anything around Jerusalem and anywhere near the vicinity of Jerusalem, that must be the Holy Land. One locale is as good as another. Jericho or Jerusalem, Capernaum or Bethsaida. All these places are compared in one little instance to Jesus. And that's enough for us. But we look at the Gospels, we forget. We shouldn't think of it as just one generalized area. Because in the stories of Jesus, the place was important. And the people in those places were important. And not just because Jesus was a real person and had to be somewhere. That's true. But when we say this, we shouldn't import, uh, forget the importance of place in the Gospels. I'm thinking also on theological lines. You know, the story of Luke tells us that no sooner than Jesus gets his ministry started, he gets baptized, and then he hightails it out some 80 miles to Galilee. And then Jesus moves over to the backward hometown of his in Nazareth. And then he settles in an equally out-of-the-place area called Capernaum. Somewhere north of the Sea of Galilee. And Luke chapter 5 opens up. He is equally in a remote place around the Lake of Gesenaret, which could be the Sea of Galilee or a small lake near the Sea of Galilee. In other words, Jesus had gone out into the sticks. He was out in the boondocks. Now, 80 miles may not sound very much to you, us that we're used to driving 70 miles an hour, and, uh, you know, we can get somewhere in a little over an hour, 80 miles. But in a day when the fastest thing was the trotting of a donkey, 80 miles was a long ways. And Jesus had taken himself far away from all things that were Jerusalem from Judea, from all things that were the religious hub, if you will. 
both physically and socially, the geographies of Galilee were heavily impacted by this inland waterway known most commonly as the Sea of Galilee. This body of water is currently approximately about seven miles by twelve and a half miles. Now, the importance of fish in the Palestine society was singled out by several geographical names. Jerusalem had something they called the fish gate. And they had several gates as you entered in Jerusalem. And one of them was something called the fish gate. Now, I don't know why they used it. You can look it up in Nehemiah 3. But there's a reason they had a fish gate. The capital of uh, Galatius uh, was Bethsaida, where we know of Bethsaida, and which was basically a fishing village. And the name Bethsaida meant fishing village or the temple of the fishing god. Located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee it was. And the Greek name for the town of Magdala, you may know it as Mary Magdala's town town. The Greek name for it is Terakchei, I guess, which was basically... Uh, processed fishville, if you would look at it. The town where fish are processed. That was the idea of this name of the town. So it didn't look like a logical choice. It was so far away from the religious understandings and centered of things. This was theologically a choice, though, of Christ. The nearness of God's great commonwealth, of God's salam peace. This had already been announced that it would be in Jerusalem, yet Jesus was making it a point to take this peace, God's word, and travel to other areas to share it with other people. Jesus had come into this world to give God's glory and grace to everyone, even to the unimportant places. There are no places where the presence and the preachings of Jesus would be wasted. Ultimately, the whole world needs Jesus. And so Jesus begins in a wider world beyond just the scope of Jerusalem. So communally and geographically this story matters, but it also matters personally. This wasn't just your lazy afternoon fishing on the banks of a pond. These were professional fishers. They had provided for their families, and th today they weren't going to be able to provide for their families. And instead of continuing fishing, they were listening to this preacher. They participated in their fishing community. They knew the ins and outs of fishing. They knew how to take care of their boats and how to take care of their equipment and to bring in their catch and to using their catch to barter for other needed supplies and things or money. Let's just say that social work, social services, religious piety, and the marketing for the church was the furthest thing on their mind. The people whom Jesus called to his side were pretty unlikely figures. After all, anybody can have a bad day fishing. Of course, if you listen to most fishing folk, they say that the number one rule about fishing is a bad day fishing beats any good day at work. So you probably know that one, right? But you don't expect professional fishers to come up empty very often. Yet these folks had come up empty. These first disciples, this was a problem for them. And if you want to find somebody to be your fishers of humanity, you might want to find somebody at least that could be a decent fisherman. Right? They were at least somewhat successful at fishing for fish. But that seems not to be the case with Simon and his company. They were no superstars even in the fishing world. There was nothing particular about them Nothing striking about them. There's no real reason why Jesus should have followed, called them to follow him. Like the nondescript location, Jesus chose his ministry with these people. They were ordinary folks. Simon wasn't kidding when he claimed that he was a sinful man, as reported in verse 8. He was sinful. He was fallible. He was imperfect at best. Sometimes we wish we could see and meet the disciples. Some people say that that would help them. You hear people say, don't you wish sometimes you could have been there? Would have been great to have met Peter, to shake Matthew's hand. 
What if now we could somehow go back in time and hear the Sermon on the Mount as if this would somehow help us to believe? But I, I really don't think it would help us. I think it would make it harder to believe. I mean, look at it. You're, you're looking at these ordinary people. If you were going to change the world, you, don't, you would try to use the movers and shakers of your time. You'd use the powerful and political, the religiously powerful. You need good images and respectable and marketable spokespeople. But that's not what Jesus used. If you took the disciples and brought them all into one room, you would never in your wildest imagination guess by looking at them that this weak-looking pack of ordinary folks could change the world. But they did. But they didn't do it by themselves. The Spirit was with them. The disciples changed the world because it was them that the secret of the universe had been revealed to them first. And they wanted to share it with other people. That's why Jesus called them in the first place. If you're going to save the world, you've got to start somewhere. And in the end, you're going to save the world through humility and gentleness and compassion and sacrifice. And it makes sense to choose a bunch of people who were humble. There was nothing about them that could be propped up. The messengers fit the message. And in fact, over the course of the ministry of Christ... Any time there was significant struggles and with his disciples, it was the struggle to stay humble and to stay ordinary looking. Every time a couple of them started angling for power or arguing amongst themselves, so who would be first and greatest among Jesus, Jesus would have to put them back down to street level. When Peter tried to wield his sword, Jesus told him to put it back in his sheath. When they tried to look down on somebody, or put somebody else down, like Mary Magla, or the children who'd gather nearby, or the poor and downtrodden, they try to keep away from Jesus. Jesus would elevate those people and remind them that God called all of them blessed. The disciples, in fact, all of the very followers, early followers of Jesus, needed to be common, ordinary, and above all, humble if they were going to really do something for Jesus for good. Still, Jesus did need them. And that's why Jesus called them. But in the calling process, there was more going on than I think we realize. Now, the phrasing that we apply to Jesus in the story, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of humanity. Often we use that phrasing, even though Luke didn't phrase it quite that way. It's a fairly simple phrase when we compare it to the hooks of modern day commercials and motivational speakers. I'm sure the disciples were not looking for a change of plans in their careers or even saw much use in following this itinerant preacher away from their fishing village. But Luke uses a phrase at the beginning of our story that is used for the first time in the Gospel of Luke, here in the chapter 5. He uses the phrase, Word of God. Logon thou theo. The Word of God. You see, it wasn't the phrasing or the sales pitch that was the hook. It wasn't that what draw people in, that gave them cause to drop what they were doing and to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Jesus wasn't bringing them some snake oil salesman type hook. He wasn't trying to set the hook with a clever phrase or drawing the people in. This was God's word. Good news. Not just reserved for those in the upper echelon of society or the religiously pious people. This was good news for all people. Amen? Good news for you and me. And now that you have it, and know it is for you, now that it's set in, it's time to share it with others. And not just casting one line to one person, but throwing a whole net. Bringing everybody in. Everything brought in. All are brought in. Everyone near and far can be caught up in the loving word of God. And you want to cast it as wide as possible. You want others to know about this love that's available to them too. Because that's what Christ called us to do. Amen. Let's pray. God, you're so kind and wonderful. We thank you for the loving words of Christ. 
God, we pray that as we leave this place today, that we know that you have called us to be fishers of humanity by following you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.